Greetings and welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel. Today we're going to talk about genetics. This is a topic which causes a lot of confusion, which is used and misused a lot. You have a lot of words that are thrown around conversationally that aren't super well understood. Okay. Um, as you get into your homesteading activities and you want to go from the entry level of I just bought six chickens and I get a dozen eggs every other day and that's all I care about to oh I'd actually like to do a breed some of my own chickens okay from I'm just buying seed at the store to grow a couple of tomato plants to oh I want to establish a planting of squash let's say that crosses in such a way that it will give me a strain of seed that's more selected for my habitat and I want to start saving my own seed right when we're making that jump okay from just being a consumer of starting reproducible material to a producer of your own germ going forward okay that's where you start to need to know a couple things about genetics right so there's a lot of words that get thrown around regularly gene and hybrid and purebred and all of these sorts of things dominant recessive dot 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 etc right it can get really confusing this video is going to be a straight up chalk talk lecture but what i want to do with it is give you enough still oversimplified but enough of the real background on genetics and how it works that you can sort out those terms understand what you're doing when you're selecting parents to produce offspring okay. cut through some of the clutter on what's hybrid what's purebred what's GMO what's all of these things what all what they all mean and help you make better informed decisions on how to design a breeding or planting program on your own farm. Okay, so let's get started with some of the basic terminology. So before we can really get into the details of genetics for hobby farmers, we need to talk about this, a gene. Right? This is what everybody wants to go to when they're talking about genetics. Like what genes are we putting in this thing? Okay. So this is what we need to define. The problem is this ends up having more than one definition because it's been adopted by common language in a rather imprecise way. So it can mean more than one thing. Okay. So we need to be a little bit more specific in order to have a robust, well-rounded conversation and dive into a little bit more of what's going on here. Okay. So to start, DNA, this is the material of inheritance, right? This is what parents pass to their offspring to, you know, dictate what they will look like. And this is stored in the nucleus of your cells. This is sort of the source code for how to build a cell. I can make a computer analogy here. Um, the source code for how to build a cell and then how you build your cells will determine how the organism functions because the organism is then made up of those cells, okay? Um, the DNA is so crucially important, if it's damaged, the organism is dead. Toast, gone, nuked, right? Literally, this is how radiation kills organisms by destroying their DNA. So it has to be protected and cared for, and has done that in the nucleus of the cell. The only thing in the nucleus of your cell is your, your primary coils of DNA and the proteins which maintain, repair, and care for that DNA. Okay, that's really all that's going on in the nucleus of the cell. Now, because the DNA never leaves the nucleus of the cell, it's unable to directly interact with the machinery that exists outside of the nucleus. So we need a messenger to come and take a little piece of that code and remove it from the nucleus where it can actually function and operate and interact with the greater cell. Okay? That's the messenger RNA or mRNA. So you have enzymes in the nucleus which go to the DNA and they say, oh, here's an interesting region with something fun that we want to do outside in the cell. They copy that region into an mRNA. Okay. Um, this is DNA transcription. 
and then that mRNA is transported outside the nucleus. Okay, so the flow of information is from the DNA to the RNA, not backwards. Okay, so the mRNA is only functional outside the nucleus of the cell. It never goes back in and does something to the original source code. It's not how it works. Okay. If anybody ever says that mRNA is doing something to the source DNA, they are blowing smoke. They are just wrong. Okay? It only exists outside the nucleus. Now, what's it do outside the nucleus? Well, it interacts with proteins, or sorry, it interacts with ribosomes to make proteins. Ribosomes have, pro, have protein components. They're mostly, again, another form of RNA that is made directly from the DNA, by the way, but some slight differences. We're not going to concern ourselves with that. Um, and the mRNA comes, it interacts with the ribosome, and it makes proteins. That's what it does. So that's our total flow of information. You have your source code. You copy a file out onto your hard drive so that you can hand it off to your friend, or sorry, onto a thumb drive so you can hand it off to your friend. Okay? And then the friend in this case is the ribosome, which says, oh, that's a cool file. I'll make a protein out of it. Okay? Now, proteins make up your cells in three ways. They're certainly not the only thing going on in your cells. You have lots of fats, you have lots of sugars, you have lots of other stuff going on. But they, uh, they do three basic categories of thing inside your cell. First, there are structural proteins, like your hair, fingernails, um, proteins which sit in the cell membrane and strengthen them and allow your cell to move organelles around. Um, your muscle can twitch because of structural proteins in your muscle cells okay, that pull against each other and allow the muscle to flex. That's the first thing, form structures. Second thing proteins can do is um, be an enzyme and the enzymes are the machinery that allow your cells to do and make things. So enzymes are the machines inside your cell. They will make new things. They will break down old things. They will change one thing into another. So this is how proteins impact all of the other non-protein stuff in your cell because they make it in the first place. Okay? Change the machinery. You change the product that you get. And then third is signal transfer from one cell to another. Right? So the protein can some cases be a signaling molecule, it can um, produce a signaling molecule, or it can receive a signaling molecule that was pushed out from another cell. Okay. And all of those are made on the ribosome from the RNA, which itself was made from the DNA. So this is the direction of flow of information. Yes, there's epigenetics. Yes, we're learning a whole bunch of other things about the non-coding DNA. But this is genetics for hobby farmers. And this is what you need to know to be a good hobby farmer. <laughs> okay? Now, diving in a little bit deeper into this stage, okay, those enzymes in the nucleus that are reading the DNA and deciding, okay, where do I want to go and make an RNA? They need to recognize a start location. So there's a start signal. They will come. They will see, oh, that's a start signal. I'll start making an mRNA. Okay, so they do. They come in here and they start making it. They read the code until they hit a stop signal, and then they fall off the, the chain. The mRNA is then tagged, packaged, and shipped out of the nucleus so that it can come out here and do its stuff. The region in between your start and stop codons, your start and stop signal, is called an open reading frame. Okay? This is the first thing that people mean when they say gene, an open reading frame. A region of DNA that directly codes for a protein that your cell wants to make and use. Okay? Now, I want to emphasize this is something which exists in physical space on a physical chain of molecules on a physical chromosome. Since your chromosomes are duplicated, you have two of each. This physical region on a chromosome is called a genetic locus. Loci is the plural. This is the second thing people mean when they say a gene. Okay, Now, 
a coding region for a protein is one type of genetic locus, and it's really the only one that we're going to discuss in this video. But there are others, right? You can have point mutations that people read for, you know, try to get information out of for like ancestry and paternity testing. Well, that can be a genetic locus that's interesting for that purpose that is not part of an open reading frame, right? So locus is a broader term. All open reading frames exist on a locus. Not all, lo not all loci contain open reading frames. So that's the second meaning for gene. Now, because you have duplicated copies of each open reading frame, you can have variations. You get two copies of every open reading frame. They can be identical or they can be different. When we have different options within an open reading frame, we call those different alleles. Okay? And these different alleles, this is the third thing that people sometimes call genes. <laughs> okay? So, context clues become important when you're talking, especially when you're talking to the general public. What, what are they talking about when they mean a gene, right? Are we talking a genetic locus? Are we talking an open reading frame? Or are we talking about two different alleles that are on the same open reading frame at the same genetic locus? Okay? So that's why I wanted to put a little bit of this in. I will try to be as specific as I possibly can. Okay. When I mean allele, I'll say allele. If I say gene, I'll use that more for open reading frame because it falls off the tongue a little faster. Now, last thing I wanted to note on this board is just kind of the scale of how many of these things we're, we're using to make an organism. So really simple, one cell organisms, you're looking at less than 10,000 open reading frames. Right, so E. coli scale of four and yeast scale of 6,000. When we talk about animals, you know, we have scale of 20,000 open reading frames. Now, yes, if you're familiar with any of the human genome research, you'll know that this gets revised up and down and up and down and up and down all the darn time, not getting into those arguments. Scale of 20,000 genes, Wikipedia numbers are good enough for this sense of scale, <laughs> okay? And the most genetically complex organisms on Earth are the plants. So your cottonwood trees can have scale of um, 70,000 genes and you know 50 to 70,000 genes is very, very common throughout the plant kingdom. We are behaviorally complex, but plants are much more biochemically complex than we are. Okay, so they're the actual winners in most sophisticated genome. Okay? Now, as a hobby farmer, the place where you will interact with genes is mostly at this level, the alleles. Okay? You're not going to be doing the sort of research of trying to pin down where on a chromosome a certain open reading frame is located and how that relates to the evolution of sweet peas. Right? That's not what you're going to be doing as a hobby farmer. You're going to be crossing two varieties of squash and trying to figure out what the outcome is going to be and alleles are where that takes place, okay? So we're going to talk about these and go back to some of the earliest history of genetics, which is the Mendelian genetics, which really describes how alleles interact with each other, and that's going to be the next whiteboard. In the previous board, we talked about different definitions for genes. In this one, we're really zeroing in on alleles and that idea of thinking about genes and how they express themselves. So, everything here, I'm talking about multiple alleles at one genetic locus. That's what this board is about, okay? Now, the two words that we bump into with different alleles are dominant and recessive. If a gene is dominant and allele is dominant, <clears throat> that means it's expressed every time it is present. Okay. Remember, these loci are coding for proteins. Usually a dominant gene, usually, there's, there's many, many exceptions to this, but in a plurality of cases, a dominant gene is either a functional protein or a version of a functional protein which is kind of hyperactive. <laughs> okay. And usually in a plurality of cases, a recessive gene 
which is a gene that's not expressed in the presence of a dominant gene. It's either an inactive variant of a protein or a sleepy lazy variant of a protein. Okay? So you can just kind of think about it in those terms, right? If recessive traits are an inactive protein, then a dominant gene, its very presence will have the function of that protein, right? And let's say uh, this, the recessive gene is a normal, like, like a receptor that is normally active, and you throw in some hyperactive ones, you get the impact of the hyperactive ones dominating over the normal ones, okay? And that's, remember, we're talking here about proteins that are going to be an enzyme making something or, or, or a receptor controlling a cellular function, okay? And it's not always known specifically what trait is linked with what specific protein and what specific function. That turns out to be very difficult to determine. And difficult to determine means a lot of money to pay for a lot of research time and fund a lot of grad students to go figure that out. <laughs> okay? So in many cases, we, we can observe the behavior of a crossing pattern and determine whether it's a dominant or a recessive gene, and it doesn't necessarily mean we know what specific protein is doing what specific thing with relation to that gene, okay? So, I have an example here. Polled versus horned pattern in bovids. Now, bovids are all of your cows, all your sheep, all your goats, muskox, etc., right? Those are all your bovids. And they follow that they all follow the same pattern. So, this is true of your milk cow and your sheep and your goat and etc. Right? It's true of antelope, right? They're bovids. So in this case, polled is the dominant condition. Polled means not producing horns. Okay? And this is in males specifically. And horned is recessive. Okay? So if you have the presence of the, the polled gene it will be polled even if it has the horned as its second copy. Okay? If it has two polled, it will obviously be polled. If it has two horned, it will be horned. But if it has one of each, the dominant condition will be the one that's expressed. And this is male horns in males. Horns in females is actually a different locus, a completely different locus, and it's reversed. So having a horned female is dominant and having a polled female is recessive. So exact same pattern of everything I'm going to talk about, but it's backwards in the females. Hmm. Okay. So, um, you know, when you're looking at a horned female, you don't know whether or not it will throw polled or horned males, male offspring. And the reverse is also true. When you look at a horned male, you don't know whether or not he will sire horned or polled females because they're different loci. Okay. Hmm. You see, we can use those words now. It's great. Okay. Now, as I said, if you have a cross, both parents are all copies dominant. This is homozygous dominant. Okay. And when you have homozygous and homozygous crossing to each other, they're all homozygous. The other synonym for homozygous is purebred. Okay, so homozygous are purebred, polled all the way around, all the offspring are polled. Very boring math, right? Same thing here. If you have homozygous or purebred horned, all offspring will be also purebred homozygous horned. Okay? What gets more interesting is when we mix it up. This is called heterozygous or hybrid. Okay? where you have one copy dominant, one copy recessive. Okay. That takes a little bit more figuring. And we figured this out with, I'm sure that many of you have seen this before, maybe not all, but this is our called our Punnett square. So we're gonna represent the parents on the top. This is one parent and that's the other parent. It doesn't matter which parent is which. We don't care which is the male and which is the female contribution, just that there's two contributions, okay? Um, newsflash, it takes two, right? Okay. Now, um, if one parent is homozygous dominant and the other is heterozygous, okay, 
we're going to get two, half of the offspring will be homozygous dominant. The other half of the offspring will be heterozygous or hybrid. But because you have dominant genes, you have the dominant condition in all offspring. These are all pulled. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, let's do the same thing. We have one heterozygous parent. Now, this time we're purebred for the recessive gene in the second parent. Okay. Well, now, right, and this is just a matching game, right? This capital P and that lowercase p. And that's convention. We always have the, the more dominant trait is expressed as a capital and the more recessive trait is expressed as a lowercase, right? So here we have two heterozygous offspring and two homozygous or purebred recessive. So when we have the heterozygote and the homozygote recessive, now we get half and half in our offspring pattern, right? So half of the offspring are pulled, half of the offspring are horned, but all of the offspring carry the horn gene, okay? And now, if you have both parents heterozygous, we get a one-two-one one pattern. Three are carrying the dominant gene, so we'll express the dominant condition, in this case pulled. One is horned, okay? But we get one purebred dominant and one purebred recessive, two heterozygous, okay? So it's one quarter are purebred dominant, one quarter purebred recessive, half are carriers of the recessive trait, though they express the dominant trait. Okay? So this is how that pattern of inheritance works. Now, that's the classic simplified case, but there's a little bit more complexity to this, okay? because I completely skipped over this set of terms. Codominant, incomplete dominant, and incomplete recessive. And all of those, there is a technical distinction between those three bits of jargon. But, as you, the hobby farmer, you don't need to worry about that. What all of these mean is that when you have a heterozygous condition, you have a blending of the dominant and recessive traits. Okay? So think of, you know, two variations of a protein and they're both moderately active. They're both going to do something. And you will see what both of them do, okay? So that's a complication. The second complication is we often have more than one gene working on a characteristic, okay? So I, let me clarify, more than one locus carrying genetic material that will work on a single characteristic, okay? So here, whether it's male or female, yes, they're two different loci, but they're both simple dominant recessive characteristics, okay? pulled being dominant in males, horned being dominant in females, but it's simple dominant recessive trait. Let's go look in another board on what happens when we throw a second gene in which impacts the same phenotype, which is the expression of all of these genes, and what incomplete dominant type stuff looks like. Now, we're looking at another level of complexity here where we have two genes interacting with each other. Okay, just top of the board for the moment. We're still looking at dominant polled recessive horned. Okay, we're still looking at male bovids. But now the interacting gene is the gene for skurs. Skurs are malformed miniature horns that may or may not be attached to the skull. Sometimes they're attached to the skull, sometimes they're just like a hardened callus on top of a nub where the horn would have grown. Okay, so it's a malformed kind of tries to grow a horn but quits. <laughs> Easiest way to describe it. Um, and the skurs, if you have the dominant gene for skurs, you will have skurs produced on a pole, otherwise polled animal. But if you don't, if you have the dominant gene for skurs and you have horns, the horned condition dominates, right? You won't see the skur formation. And if you have the recessive gene for skurs, you'll never see skurs regardless, okay? So you only see skurs when you have the polled condition, okay? Now, just like we could have a hybrid cross here, we can have a dihybrid cross. So it's hybrid at two genes, 
okay, two genetic loci. These are different genetic loci. So we can have positive, positive, we can have dominant or recessive for polled and dominant or recessive for skirts. So when these segregate, they were segregated independently of each other because they're different genetic loci and they're not linked. But um, so you could have a dominant pole with dominant skurs showing skurs going to one egg and then to another egg you could have dominant polled and recessive for skurs. Okay, so you have four different combinations. So now when we look at our pun and square, instead of a two by two, we have a four by four. Instead of four possibilities, we have 16 possibilities. Okay. And if you look how these sorted out, sort out, I color coded them again, you know, with the red polled, uh, blue horned, and black whiskers on an otherwise polled animal. And when we combine these and this all shakes out, we get three sixteenths of the offspring being normally polled, one quarter of the offspring being normally scurred, or sorry, normally horned, but three of those four carry scurs. Okay? You have nine sixteenths um, scurred. Okay? Um, and this is so high because pulled is the dominant condition. Now, also notice here, we have out of 16 offspring, hypothetical offspring, if you put 16 lambs on the ground, you wouldn't necessarily have exactly these ratios. In fact, you would almost be guaranteed to not have exactly these ratios. You put 1,000 lambs on the ground, now you're going to approximate these ratios. Okay, But our chance of getting a purebred recessive for both traits or purebred dominant for both traits are only a probability of 1 in 16. Okay. So when you're trying to think about a breeding program, if you're mixing and matching multiple genes and your goal is to eventually get back to a pure grant bred condition for all of those different loci, the number of offspring you have to breed expands exponentially with every extra gene thrown into the mix. Okay? And this is also a good example of how genes can interact with each other. Now, before going on, I also want to talk about these incomplete dominant, codominant type conditions. And a famous example of that is the blue gene in birds. So you'll see this in chickens and turkeys, especially in, you know, for if we keep our examples to domestic livestock. What the blue gene does is that, okay, so there's two types of pigments that vertebrates can make. Um, Theomelanin is brown, eumelanin is black. Okay. Um, the black pigment, when you have the blue gene pro, uh, present, normally the black pigment is a rod shaped pigment granule. The presence of the blue gene changes it to from a large rod to a small sphere. Okay. And then the light interacts with those spheres as sort of a diffraction grating, which is what gives it the blue appearance. Okay, So it's actually gray with diffraction. <laughs> okay, um, If you have one copy of the blue gene, it dilutes the black to blue. If you have two copies, it has such a profound impact and these granules get so small it looks almost white. And that's your splash bird. So homozygous uh, dominant is splash. Homozygous purebred recessive is black, the normal no change. And if you have a, one copy of each, you have the intermediate blue. That's an incomplete dominant, okay? Because one copy of the gene is not enough to drive it all the way to the almost white splash condition. That's why it's incomplete dominant, okay? So if we do a Punnett square on a hybrid cross of these, Right, one quarter is going to be blue. Sorry, one quarter is going to be splash. One quarter is going to be black, and half are going to be blue. Okay. So this is just some of the increased complexity that you can have when you start working with natural systems. Now, one more example of increased complexity I'm going to do on the next board, and that's 
a locus that has just an absolutely huge number of allelic options. Okay, so all of these are alleles at one genetic locus. This is a particularly well-studied example of a complicated genetic locus, and it's called the extended black locus. Okay? Now, extended black is one gene at this locus, but there's a whole bunch of others. We'll get, we'll get there in a second. What this locus does is it codes for a signal receptor protein that detects hormone levels in the animal's blood. And as the hormone levels go up, it triggers the conversion of theomelanin, which is the reddish brown, like Irish cheddar red, is pure theomelanin. Okay? And it triggers the conversion of theomelanin to eumelanin. Eumelanin is raven black. Okay? So it changes brown colors to black colors. And those are the only two pigments that mammals and birds can make. All other colors come from some other type of complexity. But that's a different topic in a different video. So theomelanin to eumelanin, brown to black. Now the extended black allele produces a signal receptor that is so hyperactive it is basically permanently on. Okay. So if you have even a single copy of extended black, you will have jet black hair. Okay, this is the same gene in you as it is in chickens. So the, uh, um, the receptor in this case is so profoundly hyperactive. It's such a profoundly hyperactive version that's basically permanently on and all theomelanin in the cell is immediately swept up and converted to eumelanin. So you get a jet black critter, okay? Uh, this does not cover skin pigmentation, only hair and feather pigmentation, okay? But it, the fact that it's so common to so many lineages is why so many animals have a black face, right? You can have black face gray squirrel, you can have black face um, uh, fox squirrel, you can have black face human with black hair on, on your own head, um, you know, black face chickens, obviously, black face turkeys, right? It's all the same allele at the same locus, right? We all have that in common. Now, the rest of this is chicken specific, but I think it's interesting that the, the, the dynamics of it are, are so common. Um, the wild type is kind of in the middle of the pack. Right, so you could say the wild type is dominant to brown and buttercup, but recessive to wheaten and extended black. Okay, so the top is more dominant, the bottom is more recessive. In the middle, there's a lot of codominance and interaction in specific patterns. Some will be dominant over one, but not on, over another. Okay, and they can be, you know, interact with each other. But they're all just gradations of how active the same signal receptor is. And that signal receptor, when it's active, it, it's converting more or less of the red pigment to the black pigment. Okay? So, cool example. Not unique, just a particularly well-known example of a complex locus. Now, all of the traits that we've talked about up to this point as examples have been simple Mendelian single locus traits. We've talked a little bit about some with complex allelic structures. We've talked about how they can interact with each other. But we've been talking about, you know, discrete, you know, single digit number of alleles on single digit number of loci. Okay. However, there's a whole lot of important things that we want to breed for that don't follow that pattern. All of the attributes of a critter that relate to stance, carriage, um, size, growth rate, things like this, um, there's a lot more going on. Okay? First, you have the outside environment impacting the genes. And this is the difference between genotype and phenotype. Genotype is just what's on the DNA. Phenotype is how what's on the DNA interacts with a real scenario. Okay. So, you know, eating a good diet, if you have a certain maximum potential height, eating a good diet won't make you taller. Eating a junk diet will shrink you. <laughs> As a child, you won't be able to grow to your full potential. 
Okay. So, you know, if we continue to increase the quality of human diet, we're not just going to keep getting taller and taller people. But if you look back in history where people had a junk diet, they were on average shorter. You know, that's phenotype. So, there's a concept called heritability. And it's a very difficult concept to explain by any means. It is fundamentally statistics. Now, if I were to try and go into all of the complicated statistics, we'd be here for hours. We'd have eight boards just on statistical formulas and the algorithm would hate me. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to do that. Conceptually, there's two things to think about here. Okay. One is that when we talk about heritability, we're talking about the portion of variation in a population which is coming from the genetics and not from the outside environment. Okay, So if I want to talk about comparative heritability in two different populations, right? I could have you know, two sheep populations on equally rich pasture in the same state. That's fair. If I were to talk about heritability and one population is you know here in New York and the other population is in Arizona. <laughs> now I can't talk about heritability. The outside environment is going to have a much stronger impact than I will be able to suss out just by comparing those two populations on a heads-to-heads -heads basis. Okay, So we're looking at the genetics which requires everything else to be sufficiently similar that we can actually see what's going on in the genetics. Does that make sense? Now, the second thing that we need to say is that when we're talking about heritability, what we're really talking about is how much room to move there is in a breeding project. You have more room to move when you have more starting diversity. Okay, You have less room to move when you have less starting diversity, right? So more room to move means more heritability. Less room to move means less heritability, okay? So if you think about a wild population that has never been selectively bred for anything, it has all the genes that it's capable of having and they're all just randomly scattered here, there, and everywhere, okay? So if you take a wild population and you start breeding the biggest individual to the biggest individual to the biggest individual to the biggest individual to the biggest individual, you will make fairly rapid gains up to a point of diminishing returns. And then your gains will slow down and then your gains will functionally stop. Your gains will functionally stop when you've run out of the, of the genetic diversity in the traits which add up to the thing you're measuring. Okay. The, uh, the more purebred, the more homozygous something becomes, the less gains you're able to make in these polygenetic traits, these traits that have many genetic inputs. Okay. The more hybrid, the more heterozygous the population is, the more room you have to move. Okay. And that's an important concept when we start to talk about inbreeding and outcrossing. Because there's a catch-22. The more you want to emphasize a specific trait and make it become more purebred and more um, homozygous, first, there's rapid diminishing returns after a certain point. Right, so you can only go so far, and then you, you just slam into diminishing returns. And the other is you end up concentrating a bunch of other stuff that you don't necessarily want. <laughs> okay, And that leads to inbreeding depression. Inbreeding depression can be reversed in one generation with a Y cross. Right? Re returning hybrid genetics, at, you know, hybrid genetics at all of these alleles. But then you lose the progress. Um, so you, you lose that progress, but you gain the ability to make additional progress somewhere else. Okay, So everything is this balancing act between you know the purebred genetic condition 
and the hybrid genetic condition okay, within a population. And both excessive inbreeding and excessive or poorly planned outcrossing can be very bad for your critters or your plants or whatever you're trying to breed. Okay. So all I want to do here in the final segment of this video is to introduce the concept of heritability. The next video in the genetics and small farm breeding series, I'm going to talk about inbreeding and outcrossing in detail how inbreeding depression actually can hurt an organism and how outcrossing depression can actually hurt an organism just as much as inbreeding can. So if you have enjoyed this video, I hope that you will give it a thumbs up so the YouTube algorithm knows that you enjoyed it. That's very helpful and I'm always grateful when you do that. And I will see you next time at Old Ways Rising Farm.